Before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge as well that we're on, on behalf of the University of Waterloo that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the six, na six nations that's 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. So uh, that's a territorial acknowledgement. And um, anyway, yes. My name is Bruce Muirhead. I'm the Associate Vice President for Research Oversight and Analysis in the Office of Research and also a member of the History Department. So far, far removed from what we're going to be talking, well, maybe not so far removed, actually, from what we're going to be talking about today um, with the panel. So on behalf of the Office of Research as well, I'm pleased to welcome you to Research Talks. Um, supported by the Research Support Fund, Research Talks is a regular series for staff, students, and faculty members on campus to learn more about the groundbreaking research that's happening at uh, the University of Waterloo. Today's session, as everybody knows, which is why you're here, is entitled A New Reality, Explore, Exploring Dimensions of Immersive Learning, and will include a panel presentation, all four panelists are up here, um, and discussion of, of virtual reality applications. We'll begin by asking each of our four speakers to deliver a short presentation about their research. We'll then invite the four speakers up to the front of the room to take questions from the audience. But before, just before we begin that, I'll, uh, we begin this process, I'll just tell you a very little bit about each one of the four speakers here. So Neil Randall, sitting here, is uh, an associate professor in English language and literature and di executive director of the Games Institute at Waterloo. So he's a leading expert in game studies, virtual worlds, um, rhetoric and semiotics of human computer interaction, various genres of professional writing, and the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien. And I could see an easy leap from Tolkien into yeah, everybody who's seen The Hobbit and that, yes, I'm sure, all that kind of thing. Yeah, in 2010, he co-founded the Games Institute, which is an interdisciplinary research center furthering the study of games and immersive interactive media and technologies. Neil was awarded a very significant uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council partnership grant in 2012 to form the games uh, researching network called Immerse, comprised of seven universities and six industry partners researching player experience and behavior. Both the Games Institute and Immerse are advancing research and knowledge in game-related interactions and technologies. I don't know if anybody's, or everybody's been around to see Neil's place, but it's quite remarkable in EC1, right? Yeah, so I invite everybody to go over there after this and check out and see what he's doing. You wear those funny little goggles and uh, you can sort of go nuts and all sorts of things. Um, also, I should mention that um, Neil is chair of a committee that's been established in the Office of Research, Ethics, Technology, and Social Impact Committee, which is just as it says, it's about the social impact of, the ethics of, uh, of the social impact of technology and all the associated applications in IAI, autonomous vehicles, you name it, we're now in the process of beginning to look at it. So it's a very interesting um, development in the Office of Research. So Jen Boger, next to Neil, is an assistant professor in systems design engineering and is cross-appointed to the School of Public Health and Health Systems. She's the director of the Intelligent Technologies for Wellness and Independent Living Lab at Waterloo and is the Schlegel Research Chair in Technology for Independent Living at the Research Institute for Aging. She's also an affiliated scientist with the Artificial Intelligence and Robotics Group at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute and is a member of Waterloo Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology. Jennifer's research focuses on intelligent assistive technologies for enhancing the safety, health, well-being, and independence of older adults. I'm getting there quickly myself, so I'll appreciate your work uh, sooner than you might think. Uh, and people with disabilities. Um, she employs a transdisciplinary approach to create operational activity technologies that reflect the needs, abilities, and contexts of people using them. Central theme to her research is the development of ambient zero effort technologies, and maybe she can explain what that is a bit later on, um, that blend into people's environments and operate with little or no perceived effort. And Jen is also co-chair of um, ETSI, which is the Ethics, Technology, and Social Impact Committee, so we have numbers one and two here, and a whole lot of other people um, comprise the committee as well. So Ben Sainsbury is um, founder and chief executive officer at Marion Surgical, a virtual reality surgical um, simulation rehearsal platform. Ben is a serial entrepreneur. I, that's a good thing, I think, right? To be a serial entrepreneur with a proven track record of selling 3D software and has successfully managed virtual reality development projects for entertainment and med tech space. 
He established Marion Surgical to allow surgeons, quote, to do tomorrow's surgery today. Actually, that's usually the way it is in surgery, right? You wait today and then it's done tomorrow or six months down the road, you get it done. In a 3D um, immersive learning environment, through virtual reality, Marion Surgical enables surgeons to learn, collaborate, and practice procedures in a realistic yet safe cloud-hosted environment. Ben is a PhD computer science um, candidate at the, at the Ontario Institute uh, of Technology, University of Ontario Institute of Technology, and his studies revolve around the development of virtual reality surgical simulators for urologists. And last, certainly but not least, is Evan Jones, um, is founder, creator, director, and um, producer at Stitch Media, an award-winning interactive media production services company which tells stories using new technology. Evan's work at Stitch Media combines television, radio, web, mobile games, and the real world. It's good that the real world's involved in that as well. He's a two-time Emmy Award winner and has been recognized as a top 10 um, new media groundbreaker by the Bell Fund. His documentary work has won Best in Electronic Culture at the UNESCO World Summit, and he has guest lectured on the art and business of interactive storytelling at the Canadian Film Centre, the Australian Film and Television and Radio School, and the University of Southern California. He's also consulted for the Smithsonian, Greenpeace, Microsoft, Disney, NBC, Universal, Nickelodeon, and 20th Century Fox, and the future, probably more, on the future of entertainment. Evan has degrees from the Canadian Film Centre in Interactive Art and Entertainment, from Sheridan in inter Interactive Media Management, and a Bachelor's in Arts and Science with a specialization in Computer Science and Film Studies. So I'll welcome all four speakers, um, Neil, Jennifer, Ben, and Evan, to Research Talks today. And um, thank you for taking time from your, I'm sure, very busy schedules to come and um, give us um, pearls of wisdom, I think, in the audience here today as well. Um, to begin, each panelist will provide a brief presentation that examines virtual reality applications, and then everybody will, the panel will come up to the front here and um, take questions from the audience. So make sure you prepare questions and prep yourselves before while they're talking, and uh, we look forward to a very entertaining session. I guess we're not passing around the little goggles to wear. Okay. Um, anyway, so first, Neil Randall. Come on. Entertain. <laughs> I believe strongly in interdisciplinary research, and what you see is an example of some of that happening now. Jen and I have connected up more recently. Uh, ben and I had a great talk this morning about surgical VR and narrative. And Evan and I have been partners for uh, quite some time now with a couple of really, really exciting projects. So I'm glad you could make it. Thanks very much, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do before we start, if anybody hasn't seen virtual reality, this is a light and easy version of what it is. You put these on, and then you wander around somewhat stupidly, <laughs> and you move your head all over, and there's stuff all around you. I can only mention that, first of all, because if you haven't seen it, uh, we will be having an open house in the Games Institute sometime in the fall, which will let everybody know about, and you get a chance to play with all these things. But the important part is, is that you can't get out of it without taking the headset off. If you are immersed in a film, for instance, and you get really scared, all you have to do is look at the person chewing popcorn beside you, and it takes you out of that. These things can be truly frightening, also truly absorbing in many ways, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that works now. I want to look at, because it's a particular keen interest of mine, is how we can use uh, games in one sense, but now virtual reality, to help understand things that are just hard to understand in the world. And you know, if you want to know what I'm talking about, artificial intelligence. We know what it's going to do because we've all seen Westworld. There could be some inaccuracies there. But we've heard about all this stuff and we know the potential. We've seen that the phenomenon of you know, your YouTube videos, the ones at the side in, on your browser looking much, much nicer than the ones you're actually watching and things like that. And those are being tailored to you. Ads, all these things. AI is huge. But combined with that, and one of the things that the committee that Jen and I are part of is about responsible technology and design. How do you do this without doing evil, if you will, without harming people? And we're going to talk a lot about that today, too. Because apart from everything else, VR In the old days, we held our microphones. 
I had a situation today where Ben had to make a phone call, so I said, well, there's one on the co-op student's desk, and he said, I have a cell phone. And I said, okay, I forgot that bit, okay, give, give me some time. Um, responsible technology and design. How do you design these things to, uh, responsibly so we're not endangered? We'll talk, we won't, we'll talk to some degree about that as well. Here's another thing. Equity, diversity, inclusivity. It's a core element of this university. Do you understand all the ramifications? Do you understand all the details? Do you understand that it's not just enough to say, we do equity, diversity, inclusivity? There's a ton we have to understand to do it, to understand it. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to get the, our, our, our technologies to help us do that by taking you through things and immersing yourself in these ideas. Obviously, governments around the world abandoning sorts of uh, programs like this, it's critical. Privacy, security, data, you've heard all about this. We do know that when you put your pictures up on Facebook, it's not necessarily a good idea, but it's way beyond just that, right? Our private, our security, our personal data, and our, our, our corporate data being handled all the time. Social justice, politics, social media. I put these together, not because they necessarily go together, because they're all about that social element of technology. And I put in politics in the middle because does anybody actually understand it right now? At all? I want places to go where you can tell me, okay, put me inside something so I can start to learn what's going on. Because otherwise I get it only from the media outlets and they're proving pretty unreliable too. Mental health, wellness and coping, huge initiatives happening in governments, universities, and it's a very, very complex issue. If you ever come up and think, you know what, I got a handle on what mental health is, read. But if you don't like to read, watch documentaries, watch TED Talks, or I'm hoping, play games and engage with VR. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple of VR examples, and remember, you're, you're jumping up and down if I go too long, right? So, um, and here's a couple just recent. So these, these are examples. The first one is about an immersion and presence example, and this is about walking a plank over top of, on, off the edge of a very tall building and be, having to look down. All right, this is a very simple example, just to show, even at this stage, the kind of, um, of presence that you can get through these, uh, um, these technologies. Okay, here we go. What I want you to watch for is the reactions of the people using this. Oh my god, oh my god. Fun stuff, eh? <laughs> Remember the movie The Walk from a few years ago, where you had the tightrope walk between the two you know, enormous buildings in New York? I watched that movie and was terrified from the moment it started. So then, to enhance the experience, we bought the 3D version. <laughs> and I was sick all through the entire movie. It actually pointed out to me that maybe I have a problem here that with, with heights, and it's absolutely true. There's you know, recurring nightmares about that stuff, but. This is VR. Now, here, as I mentioned, you don't see the real world. You see what's through the glasses. Now, obviously, there's a bit of a danger element there, like falling off that plank. 
some scuff, you know, because they're twisting your ankle. So there's instructions for how to do it without an actual plank, which is good, because I can't even make a plank, I don't think. But nevertheless, that's an idea of the, the level of immersion. You notice that it went from fun to terrifying for different people. These are the kinds of things that it has the power to do. The other one was um, a Stanford experiment from a couple of years ago. And I want to uh, note this because it's about the idea of awareness and empathy, which I'll go into Welcome in Welcome back minute. to KFM 98.2. This is Derek Douglas with your daily news. More hard times. Area employees are now bracing for another round of layoffs. This comes just two months after multiple companies in the area notified over 500 employees of their impending termination. Join us as we check in with our senior labor reporter. What does this mean for poverty levels? How will this affect living wage job opportunities? Will we see a push for more affordable housing? All this, up next. You've been unemployed for over two months and you need to find more affordable housing, which is difficult to do in this area. While you look for a new place, you sell objects in your apartment to offset the amount of rent you owe. Everyone's story is unique. In this first person VR interactive, face the adversity of living without a home. So the principle here is you get put into a situation where there's the potential that you will become homeless. And you are to identify with these people and as the saying goes in VR research. Um, Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. That's an ad. Um, living life a little bit in their shoes. There's a huge problem with empathy research in VR. Two minutes? Okay. Now we'll get to that in a second. All right. Thanks, Jen. Um, an example I want to point out, Jennifer Robert Smith is here, and she's one of the people uh, uh, responsible for this and who's driving the research for this example. It's, a, it's the Digital Oral Histories for Reconciliation Project. And yes, Bruce, you should know about this, you know, the history thing. Um, but it's actually looking at, for giving a VR um, setting, if you will, to hear people who experience the Nova, Nova Scotia, um, was it a school for colored children? No, 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 okay. And it's colored children. And it's a really, really interesting experience that is in the process of being made. Again, they're being opened out to the games of suit and we can feature it at that point. But do talk to Jen and I have a card of hers handy here as well. So take a look at that. Okay, I put together this slide, which are what I find to be the core elements of VR for understanding. And to race through this so we get to the next presentation. The complex issue you're trying to actually deal with. I don't care which one it is, anything that you think people should understand better in the world, should be able to understand better in the world, right? On top of this, I'm layering the 3D, a 3D space. VR is famous for being a 3D environment, a spatial environment. You can look around, you can look up and down. If it's designed right, you can see your hands and your feet, although that's still in the process of being, of being made. The simulation itself has to be, of course, accurate or it means nothing. If this idea of becoming homeless is not an accurate simulation of some sort, it will not have any real effect outside this, simula outside this, uh, this virtual reality. User interactions, all kinds of possibilities, including control systems. This one has this control system. There's haptic control systems in development and other things as well. Voice interactions are being worked on. The immersion and presence element gets kind of layered on for the user to make sure it's effective. Do they get immersed? Is there, they have a feeling of presence, which is basically a feeling of being there, being inside it. Obviously, the people on the plank felt that way. The people at the Stanford experiment did end up, many of them they interviewed, caring more and actually contributing more as they could. That doesn't mean it was empathy. It definitely means it was sympathy. There's a big discussion about that. We have the interactive narrative component on top which is the thing I specialize in most. What does the interactive narrative even mean? If it's a story, we're used to experiencing it all at once. This way we have to do something. Awareness of something leading to empathy of something. If it's not going to do that, it could be fun, but it's not gonna help you understand these complex issues. And these lead to the whole concept of understanding. Ideally, it kind of fits like this, although none of these things get designed in that order specifically. A few big questions. How do we teach VR literacy? We can teach you know, reading as a literacy, writing as a literacy. There's all kinds of user, com computer user interaction literacies. 
there are, we ought to understand how to watch films from the time we're very young. We're trained to do that. What about, and we're taught, how do you get taught to play games, game literacy and VR literacy? Can interactive narratives actually become a primary story form? We're working on that now. Is a bit of empathy good enough? Is that okay? If I get a bit emp em em empathetic? Or is, or is the sympathy you know, strong enough to, to, to move it forward? How can we design responsibly for empathic input, impact? And what are the limits of immersive endurance? How long can you keep this up? Well, right now people get sick after 10 minutes sometimes. How about the technology developing so you can do it longer? And what, if you do that, what does it do to your psychology, to your mind, to your brain? We don't know, it's your eyes. And why aren't we doing much, much more of this is the final question before I break. Because I think it's powerful, I think it's potentially rich, I think it could be potentially terrible, like all new technologies. Remember 3D television? It failed because there was never a single movie made that required it, basically. Even the ones that I got sick for, right? It wasn't necessary. We ought to do things that are necessary in the VR environment. All right, I'll stop now and turn it over to Jen. Thank you. Oh. Great, hi everyone. And thank you, Neil, for the brilliant introduction to VR. That was, I learned a lot, always do. Um, I'm gonna continue to show an example of a virtual reality application we're developing in my lab, the Intelligent Assistive Technologies for Wellness Lab here at U Waterloo. Um, and it's not just my work. This is a very collaborative work, myself, others in the department, people in kinesiology, et cetera. So what I'm gonna show you is definitely a team effort. And what we looked at doing is, as Neil said, VR is very immersive. It's very engaging, it's very intuitive. So we looked at, okay, this is a great new thing. What can we do with VR and people with dementia? The answer that came back was exercise. We actually took the VR system to Schlegel Villages, which is a large long-term care, a bunch of long-term care facilities around Ontario. They have five and a half thousand staff and five and a half thousand residents. And we took the VR to their recreation team and asked them, if you had this system, what ideally would you want to do with it? And they said, we want exercise. Why is this? Well, Exercise is just as beneficial for people with dementia as it is for all of us. It helps with mood, it helps with cognition, it helps you make you feel good, it helps with behavior. But the problem is, is especially once you get towards moderate stages, so more advanced stages of dementia, exercising in a group becomes really, really hard because of difficulties with communication and perception. People can't keep up with the group speed, et cetera, and so what happens is they just don't bother. So now they're sitting in long-term care, not moving, every day, and they're in the same place every day, and I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like too much fun. So here's a great example of, well, two birds with one stone. Let's get people exercising more, but also in an engaging way where they're going somewhere else. So we have a population that's relatively physically restricted, but now the potential of whatever we can imagine in terms of environments. So those were our research goals. Let's create a VR system to promote exercise for dementia. But this was the first that had been tried. So some people had tried VR with people with dementia before with prepackaged games, but no one had looked to develop for exercise based on best practice. And what I mean by that is we co-designed the whole thing. So we had a a uh, exercise therapist from Schlegel as part of our research team every step of the way feeding in about what exercises they do. So not just any old movements, but what are the movements that actually help people maintain range of motion, strength, get their heart rate up a bit, et cetera, but also by proxy, what would be acceptable for people with dementia, what are exercise therapists looking for in terms of outcomes, all these different things. And then we did iterations with people with dementia as well. So people with dementia were part of our co-design process where we took iterations of the design and tested it out with them to see what's working and what's not. Um, which I kind of just covered right here. 
So it wasn't just us building off the top of our heads and to Neil's point very much. We're looking at what sort of environment and experience is good for them. And one of the first questions that came from the therapist was this very real concern that this would be very confusing for people with dementia, that they're in this world, and then suddenly they're somewhere else, and then they're back here again. And how, are the, how is that going to affect them? Um, so that was something we took very consciously into our design, and we were working with them to develop strategies to ease people in and out of the environment, which I'll show you in a minute. The environment we decided to do is a farm. Why farm? Everyone's like, farm, you can do anything. Why farm? Well, farm, everyone recognizes it right away, right? Especially Kitchener area. <laughs> I'm not to disc K-dubs, but you know, um, there's a lot of farm around here, and a lot of people who are in care around here were farmers. So it's intuitively either they were, either it's from their past, something from their past, or something that resonates implicitly with them. And again, with dementia, you want something that they understand. Abstract doesn't always work so well, and it can work very, very differently for different people. But a farm. There's all sorts of implicit cues here. I know where I am. I know what a box of, a box of apples, that makes total sense. I'm on a farm, right? The other thing is, is this sort of environment is really nice to play with in terms of eliciting different movements. You can emulate almost any movement on a farm through some task, right? Um, for example, um, I don't know. So I'll go through the tasks in a minute. But for example, as I go through the task, we'll show you. So the first one they wanted, actually they wanted a really long list and like everything else when you're designing something, everyone wants everything for free, no wait, no cost, and tomorrow. And so, okay, we have to pick and choose. So they gave us a list and then uh, we worked with the therapy team at Schlegel to cut that down to just five for the first version, because we only have one master student. <laughs> so that was all she could do. Um, so the first one is head, neck, flexion, extension. There's a lot of trouble, because they sit a lot, and they're looking ahead a lot. So just that simple motion was just watching a butterfly fly back and forth. Seems really simple, but it worked right away. The butterfly, high contrast, not a lot of distractions in the background, et cetera. So they sit down, they put it on, the butterfly starts moving, immediately they're gravitating towards it, they just naturally watch it. it, was, it it's pretty simple. Then reaching straight ahead, it's another task where it's just sort of like this. You can think about exercise classes and imagine this. Here we have a sorting task, apples and oranges. There's no button presses in this game. You've got the controllers in your hand, as soon as your virtual hand touches an apple, it's stuck there until your hand goes in the apple basket. This keeps people from making errors, right? If they're trying to put it in the orange basket, it's just not gonna work. And by just exploring their environment, they'll finally, on purpose or by accident, get it in the apple basket, it detaches, and then they've got it. It's very real time in terms of cause and effect, and it all makes a lot of sense. Cross-reaching, same idea, just across their body. Overhead reaching with stacking crates of apples onto a cart and rowing in a rowboat, which was pretty much everyone's favorite and it's also the therapist's favorite because this, that's a really good bang for your buck in terms of exercise. The therapist really wanted us to design a pet store, but as we pointed out, how are you gonna emulate rowing in a pet store, <laughs> right? Petting two bunnies at once or something, <laughs> like we're not sure what we're gonna do there. So, you know, it's this, like constant give and take between what's realistic in terms of game development, but also in terms of uh, what people find engaging. The other thing we had to figure out was how do we calibrate this thing? Super, super important. And this isn't just because of dementia, but as we get older, we tend to collect different uh, conditions. It's just the way it is. So a lot of these people don't just have dementia, they've also had a stroke or they have arthritis, or all of the above. And so they might have one side where they can reach really well, and the other side hardly at all, or they're not, they just can't go very far, their range of motion's restricted. Also, six foot two guy versus five foot two lady, 
how far they can reach is going to be really different. So we needed to be able to calibrate it simply. And we did that by hovering apples in front of them, first straight, then up, and then to the side, every time they touched it, as far as they could go. And then we took that, we mapped it in 3D as their range of motion, and we pulled everything into 80% of that reach distance. Now the game's fun, because you can actually reach stuff in it. Because <laughs> if it's out of reach, it's just frustrating. So I have a video. I didn't know if I'd have time or not, but it looks like we did. I'm not going to probably show the whole thing, but just some choice bits. Um, <laughs> so these are real people with dementia. And it's the first time they've put this game on. So she's doing the calibration task. Okay, it's just however far is comfortable. Oh, we'll come back. Oh, it so you can yeah. see her range of motion and her ability is dramatically different from the person before. But she can still do the task. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Come on. Come on, all your beauty. I love it. I love it. Right. So, I mean, they are reaching out, but it doesn't matter. Whatever. Their head's moving. That's the most important thing for this exercise. And it's interesting because as we're evaluating the efficacy, some people will get like really competitive. They're like, oh, I'm going to lift these apples. And other people are just like, whatever. You know, they do one and they're like, oh, there's another one. Okay, fine. So, you know, you had really different speeds. And again, it doesn't matter. It just matters they're active. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you knew what to do. Look at that. So there she tries to put it in the oranges. Doesn't work. And then she self corrects. She's like, oh yeah. Oh, I'm getting the two minute warning too. Yeah, we both we like to talk. Um, rowing one's pretty fun. So, oh yeah, for this one you can see one of them only rows with one hand, etc. And then that's just some feedback. So the feedback was really, really positive um, from the people who used it, as well as the therapists. We didn't have any adverse reactions. No one was freaked out. No one got sick, but that could be just because our sample size was smaller. But they were wearing it for 15 minutes. And it was usually you know, us terminating. We didn't have people asking to stop. We were like, OK, that's 15 minutes. That's probably long enough. I'm going to take this off now, right? Especially rowing. They just kind of, and we'd be like, do you want to keep going? They're like, yes. And you know, um, but this also speaks to something very important, which is the idea of cognitive restraint. So this is a thing in long-term care, um, which is the idea that a lot of people have heard about music being used. So people have their own iPods now, people with dementia, with the music they like on it so they can listen. But one thing that can happen is, is you plug them in to their music, and then they get distracted. And they don't necessarily want to listen to the music anymore, but it takes too much cognition or you know they don't have enough parallel processing to be able to express that they don't want to listen anymore, or they don't even realize they've been listening for a long time. Um, just because of all the different difficulties. And what happens is, is if therapists aren't paying attention, then there's this potential for people to get plugged into devices, and then they're just sitting there, and people don't have to worry about them. So this was something the therapists really expressed strongly. This is cool, but we have to figure out ways of mitigating and managing so that it's not misused, where if this gets deployed in long-term care, and you're having a busy day, and you know, the fit's hitting the shin, and you're just going crazy, and you're not plugging in this guy who's having behavioral outbursts just so that he'll be quiet, you know, which you could understand how that could happen, but it's not necessarily an ethical use of the technology. 
So the idea of zero effort really fast is the idea that here, people could just sit down and play it. There was no learning, there was no instructions. It was designed to match their abilities and expectations. So that when they put this thing on, they knew what to do, and it was also supporting them in doing it. Right? We weren't keeping score. There was no timed, you know. But that's not appropriate for maybe a 15-year-old male. Right? There, you want a score, you want challenge, you want time frames, because that's what's fun. So, you know, to the point, to each their own, and that I think one of the biggest tech in general, really, but VR as well, is this idea of the potential to customize to people's abilities and needs so that you have situations and environments that are really meaningful for them. So thank you very much. And now I get to pass the mic on to the next presenter. So now moving on from <clears throat> academia to uh, uh, business application. Uh, so what, uh, what I'm in the market with is a virtual reality surgical simulator. Um, and my partner, Rajiv, is a urologist at the Michael Guerin Hospital. And I actually, as part of my PhD, built this cardiac stent prototype in, for Google Cardboard, showed it to Rajiv, and he became very interested in this technology for um, teaching uh, kidney stone removal operations. So we partnered up and started a business together. And um, I'm going to let him do the talking, so I'm going to skip uh, to his video. Well, actually, no, I got, a, I got an order here. Uh, <laughs> so the idea here is uh, about virtual reality, immersive environments. What we're displacing with our technology is pig labs. Um, so pig labs are typically used to teach the tasks that we're, that we're training on with our virtual simulator. Um, the things, the disadvantage of the pig lab is, uh, um, well, there's the see one, do one training. I took this picture inside of uh, the lab where basically you watch and observe a surgeon and slowly he gives you tasks such as, okay, now you're going to suture the patient or you're going to do, um, you're going to remove this stone or gives you gradually over your residency more and more complicated tasks to, to do. Um, that doesn't always happen. Um, it's very challenging to get the time to do those tasks with the surgeon. So it's not an effective way of training. And there's no metrics. You don't know if the, the person's any good. And it's high risk for the patient. Um, so high risk for patients, no tracking, takes a long time to train. Um, so the next is pig labs. I'm going to actually show you a pig lab video here. There we go. So we, we set up this pig lab to kind of learn how it's, the training's done right now. So that uh, device is a C-arm. It has an x-ray view. It's a 2D view of the inside of a kidney. In this case, it's a pig kidney. And uh, you're basically trying to learn a 2D, on a 2D plane, you're trying to learn how deep and what angle to do the needle puncture. And it's challenging perceptually to figure that out because you've got something that you're doing tactile uh, with your hands to make, that, uh, to make that puncture, but you're looking at a 2D screen and trying to learn that. So that's currently how it's done. And the, the challenge is that uh, there's radiation. So that C-arm is, is, is what you use in the actual surgery. And, you're, you're getting radiation poisoning from, from that. So the last thing the surgeon wants is when he's been treating patients all week to then spend the weekend training people and getting additional radiation exposure. So with the VR environment, we're, we're basically, um, there, is no, there, is no, uh, there is no radiation poisoning. And as we've talked to the Royal College of Surgeons in Canada and Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, things are moving towards competency-based training. So with pigs, you know, after a couple hours, it's pretty greasy and gross, and there's no metrics. Um, so this is what we've built. It's a virtual reality uh, platform. There's haptic robots, which actually perform, 
provide force feedback so it feels like you're really pushing into tissue. A lot of time is spent you know, making that right for the surgeon so it actually feels like you're making a puncture into the skin and into the fat and down to, to the kidney. And uh, we're using real surgical tools. So our first customers are medical device companies uh, that are very interested because we're actually putting their tool end effectors on, on the device itself. So I'm going to let Rajiv do the talking now because he's way better at explaining it from a clinician point of view. Uh, you know, essentially, I'm a surgeon. I've been a surgeon for many years, and I've really seen over that time a magnitude shift in how we train our, our patients, how we basically learn procedures and how we get better. Operating room resources are expensive. We have to be a first and foremost mindful of patient safety. If we can create opportunities to allow our trainees to practice and develop some skill acquisition outside of the operating room, by the time they come into the operating room and work alongside of us, they'll be starting at a higher level. So the Marion Surgical Platform, this immersible virtual reality platform, not only can we potentially simulate a whole variety of procedures uh, to, to allow trainees to, to work, work themselves up to a certain skill point. You could actually even have someone like me take real images. So you know, I'm in the operating room tomorrow, for example, and I can put up the CT scan of what I'm planning to do tomorrow. And what I would normally do is just a chart review in the office. And, uh, but you know, wouldn't it be great if I actually have the ability to look at that man's or that woman's scan upload it into the Marion Surgical server and, and essentially do a trial run and, and, a, and a practice run of that procedure. It's, it's got to make us better surgeons and ultimately I think that's much, much better. So what he mentioned there was we are using real patient data. So the cases that we're creating are from CT scans that we've uh, sourced from uh, St. Michael's Hospital. And um, while we're talking to the Waterloo immersive uh, games lab is whether it's more effective for the training if we actually have a narrative behind that patient. So at the moment, we anonymize the data because it's real patient data, it's a sensitive uh, you know, uh, patient data. But if you, there was a storyline before you went to uh, operate on this patient, if you knew that you know, they weren't be able to, to withstand uh, being under um, anesthesia for too long, and that's something that you have to worry about as somebody operating or the patient is X years old and you knew a little bit of a narrative, would that uh, actually be, uh, would, you, would, that be, would the training be more memorable? So that's some of the things that we're talking about doing with, uh, with the games lab um, to do some of those, uh, to add those, those narrative stories to our, to our training. And just a little bit about the team, myself, and um, we've got some advisors um, and various developers. This is us. We're in the Autodesk uh, incubator. Um, another surgery we're doing next is uh, vein harvesting for cardiac surgery. So we're working with a surgeon at um, uh, Queens at uh, Kingston General on that procedure. Uh, we've, we've taken our training platform to uh, Ireland, to France, Boston University. We've done classes at UPenn. Um, so uh, we've, we're, we're getting lots of feedback. And what's interesting about taking something like this around the world is that there's different techniques. So we're now adding ultrasound because there's some countries that don't do the C-arm, they use ultrasound, and so that's something that we're starting to expand our, our platform so that it's a little more uh, useful around the, around the globe. And just a little, some of the feedback we've gotten from it, that was a class at UPenn, that was the class we did at Royal College. Um, there seems to be some interest. We find if anyone's over 50, they're not really interested. If they're under 50, they are. If they're a surgeon around 30, 40, they probably are gamers, so they're very interested. So we're finding uh, that we're getting some good um, uptick. Uh, UPMC and St. Mike's, we did some studies on toolpath. So we were able to tell uh, expert versus non-experts based on the toolpath uh, that they perform the surgery. So that's kind of a way to differentiate between surgeons that are experts and non-experts. It's beyond the face validation of the simulator. So that was a positive uh, report that we uh, published at the AUA last year. And uh, we're doing a study now with St. Joe's where we're taking two patients that have agreed to um, use our, their CT scans and a surgeon's gonna practice in our uh, platform on those cases 
then he's going to go perform the real surgery, and then we will be able to determine, which we're hopeful it, that it helped him in that rehearsal. Kidney stone surgery, a lot of it's a lot of bread and butter, kind of easy surgery. You might not want to do a practice run, um, but for more complex surgeries, or if the patient has spina bifida or some complication, then it could become, it could save time and ultimately lead to um, better patient outcomes. And that is exactly 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, there are a lot of talk about hands and embodiment of where your hands are in the scene and how you manipulate things. When you're holding two objects and then you're supposed to bend down and reach something, it's like, well, what, what, my hand doesn't change at all, actually. But uh, the point being is that we've focused so much above the waist, we've actually created a lot of problems below the waist, which is movement. And you know we have these, these ideas of six degrees of freedom where we can walk over and our headset will track and it will say, okay, I'm lower now and I'm higher, but that's only in the space that we've cleared in the living room or the research lab that we're working in. And so, as we know from almost every other media, we, we would like to experience more than just the 10 by 10 box that we live in. Uh, we'd like to go to the farm and we'd like to go further than that, that small space. Uh, but what that presents us with is another problem, which is about how to, how to make that segue to the next moment. And I think, you know, there was these big revelations in the early days of filmmaking of like, well, you can just cut straight to the next shot. You can just change the frame of the camera and, and people can just jump cut, you know, directly to that scene. I've experienced that with some virtual reality projects. Uh, one, an incredible one, where they went into the LA Symphony and you were standing basically at the, at the conductor's podium and you were watching the, the performance as if you were the conductor and then without warning, you were 100, 100 meters straight up looking down at the symphony and it was as close to the experience of that plank walk as I could possibly describe because you know, that's not something, we don't like being teleported without, without agency is what it turns out we've learned as one of the things that virtual reality needs is a kind of language and people do use teleportation quite a bit in the, in the way that uh, these things work. And so we said, okay, we're trying to design a project, uh, we know all of these design constraints and so what are we going to build? So, what I will just quickly talk you through is a concept where we took the idea of saying you are trapped. You are trapped because you are trapped by the virtual reality. You are sitting in a chair, you have the ability to move your hands, but you don't have the ability to leave this physical space. And so that's where we start the entire concept is that as a flow weaver, you are stuck to this spot, but you have a trick up your sleeve, which is the most unreal thing that you can possibly imagine, which is that you can tear holes in the fabric of reality. You can reach out and grab reality itself, and you can tear a hole in it and project yourself into a new world. And the reason that that works so well in this game is because we don't have a context for doing that. Uh, you know, as soon as you employ a mechanic like this, it becomes this layer of abstraction that people just embrace as opposed to judging the fidelity of the experience. And so I could talk you through, through the storyline at length, but I know that we have time that we want to make sure that we have questions. The point is, is that this project is a project that we're collaborating with the Games Institute to create. They're doing some work on embodiment research and how do you, how do you put hands and legs into a space where you know, we don't necessarily measure those things. And so how do you assume those? And, uh, and we're creating a game that is meant to be w probably one of the longest virtual reality games you'll hear about. It's a five plus hour experience. It's not the 15 minutes. It's not the, it's not the perhaps one hour <laughs> procedure. So it's, it's meant to be a long play. And the reason is because we're building this over the next two years and we're expecting the fidelity to increase. Part of the reason that we don't like spending so much time is because there, things are heavy, things are uncomfortable. There's lots of other form factors that we're working towards fixing. And so we're trying to project forward into a reality in which all of those constraints are gone, but we still have some of the constraints of just reality itself that we're dealing with. So I am actually going to swap it over with my final time to a quick trailer so that you can see where it's at. It's, it, it's a prototype right now, and uh, we're going to be spending the next 16 months working on it. So you can, you can ask Neil whenever you want to see an update on it, but this is just a one-minute version of it. Flows of magic are unfamiliar. The flow 
forms of this world are uniquely connected, layered. Do something there. So what we've done is taken some of the conceits of escape rooms and created a project where you are trying to escape the room by solving puzzles, but uh, what you end up doing is, uh, maybe just replay it here with no sound, uh, is that you're using something that we've invented called quantum objects, which is that when you're traveling between the different dimensions, uh, the idea is that things that you change in one dimension have ripple effects and reflections in the dimensions that you may be more familiar with, and they get increasingly more surreal and less connected to reality as you go deeper and deeper into them. And so it's a journey sort of into your own madness, into your own examination of reality itself, but the, the, the tools that you use are that you have to go layers and layers deep sort of in an inception style storyline so that you can change the thing that you couldn't change in the dimension previous, and, uh, and then when you come back, you find your way out of the story. And so that's the goal of Flow Weaver and a project that's coming soon. This is a sneak peek, and uh, I would welcome any questions. I know that we're moving to that stage. Great. Thank you. So the first study was a proof of concept study, because we really just had no idea how our people going with dementia, going to even react to a virtual reality environment and trying to get a better feel for what type of game design was most appropriate um, and if it would elicit the type of motion we were looking for. And so it, it did that. So now we're convinced that this is actually a valuable way and more importantly, the therapists are convinced. So. Um, when we were trialing it, actually, one of the therapists was like, oh, I didn't know she could move like that. And I'm like, oh, researcher gold, right? Like, that's it. We're done here. <laughs> we, you know, but it's that sort of feedback. But yes, when we did efficacy study, we actually had three conditions, human guided. Um, we had an avatar in a gym to mimic the human guided. And then we had the farm. In all conditions, we'd add once per day for five days, which is way more than they usually get. Pretty much everyone was sick of every condition by the end of the week, including, but less so with the human. So that speaks to the fact that, you know, our, some of our next steps, there's many now. Now the door is open. So there's lots of stuff we want to do, objective movements, uh, reward systems. So this is a really big one. Um, and I saw some of my lab groups here. I saw John before, but he's not here. A postdoc of mine, he's really interested in looking at reward systems for people with dementia. How do you provide reward systems that people can understand and that are appropriate, but are not necessarily uh, goals-based in the same way most gaming is? Because their abilities change dramatically. So from day to day and over time, there's a lot of variation. So you might be able to do one thing today that you can't tomorrow. And so we don't want to make it devo demotivating. Um, as well as, of course, different environments, more exercises, more tasks. Um, and also we're looking at creating intergenerational gameplay. So that's another next step too. What we really want to try to do is how can we build games where people with dementia can play with their grandkids remotely, say, right, in some sort of collaborative gaming experience to try and also pull in that social dimension um, that we might be able to access. You, you need to talk to John Harris. <laughs> Hi, John. See, I was saying, I, we'll introduce. Yeah, okay. I, I meet people at these events all the time. It's great. Now, there's a question here. Too. Sorry, John. Thanks to all of you for a very engaging presentation. I was struck by a comment that I think Neil made, which is that virtual reality can be used to understand complexity. I think you said something like that. And so Sorry, I'd like what, what to... what did I say? 
John? I thought you said that virtual reality can be used to understand complexity. You did say that, right? Okay, good. So I can continue. <laughs> so I'm a biologist, and biological systems are exceedingly complex. So I'm going to give you two examples, and I'd like you to explain, if you can, how virtual reality can be used to understand these complexities. So the first has to do with a process called electron transport, whereby electrons are transported across membrane, and this gives rise to the formation of energy, biological energy. In the case of photosynthesis, for example, it converts sunlight into biological energy. And this is done by a very complex membrane that has lipids and proteins which fold and change dimension, and it's a very, very complex process to understand. So let's move to another example, the, the transmission of, uh, of uh, neural impulses through the brain and the plasticity, if you will, of these networks and how they change under certain conditions. So in simple terms, my question is, how would one use virtual reality to gain an increased understanding of the complexity of these systems beyond the understanding that we are achieving with what you might call conventional reality, which are the tools we use now. Okay, so first of all, let me state, because one thing I didn't state in here, that there is there's no one way to understand anything. And I'm adding virtual reality and in fact, serious games, if you will, to the list of things we already do. We read our journal articles, we read magazine articles, we watch documentaries, we watch all sorts of things, to make these things happen. It's another layer over top. What I think, what the games world has shown us is that if you get into something somehow and participate in it, where you have to make things happen and it doesn't just come to you, then that can, and I will emphasize can, increase the level of understanding because you're forced to understand some of the processes involved. What virtual reality has the potential to do, and by the way, John, the answer to your two questions is, I have no idea because I don't even know the topic. So my first I was stage, afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that. But, but, but you see, you do. And the way I operate with any of these and any of the grant proposals I put through is I'm not the domain expert. I'm the person who wants to layer these technologies, these immersive media onto that topic. But I need the domain expert, the, the experts in the field, to actually tell me what's right and what's wrong. If I want to explain to anybody about what the impact of, of quantum cryptography is going to be uh, over the next 10 years, I'm not going to guess. I'm going to go to IQC and find the people who are doing this work and get them. In fact, we did some of that earlier on. So the answer is, I don't know. What, what I'm, I'm going to guess that it's almost like the, you know, the, what was the, 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 the Jules, Jules Verne movie where you go through the body, right? You can't remember what it's called. Um, or this whole idea of these, 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 where you can actually get inside and, and, and interact with things once you're inside the, these processes making them. So they become a simulation of the process itself that you can actually interact with. There may be ways to do that, including you stop it at a certain point, and then the famous thing that games do is the choice and consequence idea. You have different things you can actually do, and they will make things happen in different ways. So. It's a very simplified answer to the question that the media lets us immerse ourselves in the object or process that, that we're, we're studying. And if you layer on top of that an interactive system of some sort, you can start to manipulate the items inside this process and find out what happens if this happens or if you do things differently or if the thing gets blocked or screwed up in any other way and we can find out how these happen. Does it, is it going to improve your understanding of a really rich, complex issue? I don't know, that's the research question. My belief is it can, not for everybody, but certainly for people who, who already engage with these kinds of technologies or who want to. Um, but that's the caveat I give you, is that so, it's not so a one-stop one fits all. All right, so just two uh, quick questions. One, one for Neil and then one for the uh, panel in general. They're more important. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first question is, so you and I are in the same department. I'm not a programmer. I'm not an animator. If I have an idea, if I have a concept of how I'd like to integrate uh, VR into something that I do as a part of my teaching, and I know exactly what I want it to look like, what is my first step? Do I just come into the Game Institute and say, here, 
Here's an idea. <laughs> do it. Okay, quickly. <laughs> you can come into the Games Institute, and I will tell you to go find somebody who can do this for you. Okay. Because I will help you try to find somebody to do this for you. But first thing I keep telling people is, <clears throat> in my case, some people in the Games Institute build things, build media. I don't. I provide the theoretical layers on top of it, and hopefully that will Im impact the design. But that's not something that you're not, we don't have a team of people waiting around to help you do these kinds of things, which is unfortunate. If there's funding available, please let me know and we'll get that team in place. But, um, so that's the first hit. Do you have one more question? Right, and for the panel in general, um, it seems so expensive, right? Which is, I think, a, a part of the reason why it's not as mainstream as it could be. Uh, the Oculus Rift is fairly expensive. If you go to any of these VR playgrounds, I think they charge like $50 for half an hour or something like that. I, I can't imagine a, a stage where it would be something that everyone has, like a cell phone, uh, for instance. Why is it so expensive? And, and when do you imagine well, it might the, turn the, ha the have not problem with technology is, is about more than VR. It's about all kinds of things, smartphones uh, being one of them as well. But what I will say is the, tech, is, is the prices are dropping constantly. They will drop further. But I think these are the people you should ask about that because if they know how expensive things are more than I do, it's them. And you, you, you develop it for a particular market. If you're in the teaching world, yeah, it's a big problem. But the, the, the tools to develop things will become more readily available. The technology will drop in price. I'll let, you're not going to get school boards to buy these things right off the bat. So um, it's a matter of trying to do the work in advance that you want to do and then wait for the world to catch up with you, I think. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, we're, we're betting the things. I've got the mic already still. Uh, but we're betting on things getting less expensive. I think you look at things like digital photography that have come down in dramatic price scales uh, recently. So, you know, we're, we're, we're betting on that horse. Um, you know, Ben's doing much smarter work, which is working with people where someone else has bought the device and then the, the, the real audience is using it. I mean, we have to convince somebody that our trailer looks so good that they should buy an $800 face mask and then our game. And so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big uphill battle. Um, we're, we're seeing more and more, you know, ways that people are convinced. I, uh, I think I actually wanted to return to your earlier question, which is like something from my mindset is that I have ideas all the time that I want to do, but really my trick is finding somebody else, usually who has the resources to, and, and telling them why it's valuable and like saying, look, this is some impact that you're going to have or something, you know, these are the outcomes, especially if you're solving one of their problems. You know, and it, it's difficult in the education sector to, to because the students are certainly going to pay, uh, but they, the, you know, showing efficiencies and things are, are really a great way to sort of present your idea instead of being like, this is something I want to do. It's like, this is a way that I'm going to help you do things more effectively. Yeah, I, and just to add to that, it, outcomes is really important for motivate. You have to motivate people as to why they want to spend. So, and I think another sort of low-hanging fruit is to target group applications first. So a lot of long-term care facilities are actually buying VR headsets. And most of them only get a small packet of money for recreation, and they're investing in these relatively very expensive things because they're fun and they work and people love them. And so you have all these outcomes where it's a shared device. So everyone in long-term retirement, potentially hundreds of people, one set, so, you know, if you do cost per person, it kind of makes sense. But also, it's an experience that they just, that has a big impact on the quality of life of these people. A lot of people, the peop it doesn't work for everyone, but the people it works for, it really works, and they really love it. So there's this very strong argument in terms of outcomes and uh, utility that then enables the institution to actually invest the money in it. And then the more systems that are bought will drive the cost down more, and soon we'll all have one with many games that... <laughs> I hope so. I guess we'll look to Rebecca. Time for one more question? Yes, as long as it's quick. How important is the next thing anyway? <laughs> Thank you. So this is a question for uh, Ben. So uh, I know that you're an entrepreneur, and um, like St. Michael's probably 
not your only like targeted customer. So a thing in public health is that there's standardization issues between the hospitals. So like one might have the Oculus, one might have the Vive, et cetera. So how do you determine what are the features that you want to keep um, from your experiments at like one hospital to carry on to your product to uh, commercialize for other hospitals? Um, so it's the same platform. We're selling the, we're not selling like a game. We're selling the hardware and the software, so they would have the same system. But one of the things that we are um, capturing with the data are differences between hospitals, which is kind of interesting. So we're able to take a cohort from St. Mike's and see what their scores are like and maybe some techniques that they're using that are different from another hospital. And then in our data, able to analyze and what we're thinking as we get into more complex surgeries that we might be able to um, figure out best practices and also capture some of that tribal knowledge. So we could say, well, why are the surgeons in Buffalo faster than the surgeons in St. Mike's? What are they doing differently? And our system would be able to um, present that data. But uh, yeah, everybody's using the same platform that we're creating and the features are really you know, uh, based on the equipment that they're using. So ultrasound versus CT versus, so it's really, and also, you know, prone position versus supine position. So we're just adding those features, but as a customer, you'd have access to, to either or inside the software. Thank you. I also have a question for Ben. Um, I was quite interested in how you're actually measuring surgeon improvement, comparing, say, the pig lab versus the VR. Um, for example, with the last study you were showing, you can't exactly operate twice on the same patient. So you can't, in a lab, you could potentially, with a VR patient, you could operate once as if it's, you know, as if you were applying it with the pig lab and then once with the VR, but we don't really have that opportunity going in. You have one chance to do the surgery. So how are you actually recording and sort of keeping a record of improving, proving that there is improvement with the VR versus other methods in one individual surgeon? Are you talking about the, the project that we're doing with St. Joe's? Um, I think it was one of the last projects. Yeah, said Saint, you were so at St. Joe's we got two CT scans and the, the surgeon's going to try uh, with the simulator, and then he's gonna go and do the real surgery. And so the, the idea would be, um, did that improve his surgery time, et cetera? It's more like a, a survey that we're gonna do at the end. But I think what you're talking about is, how could you get real data and have a control study if there's only yes. one patient you're not gonna put the kidney stones back in and try yeah, it again, right? Exactly, right? So yeah. how do we actually know that we have seen improvement? How do we have a control for that? That's a good point. I think it would just be sort of, um, um, I, uh, the only way I can think of it is if you have a, a larger cohort. This is just one surgeon doing it. So if you had a group of surgeons that used the simulator and did the, the surgery and of a similar case and then you had ones that didn't and you compared those scores, you could do that. Right, because um, if I'm a surgeon, I want to make sure I'm actually improving with the VR technology as opposed to if I was doing it the way I normally would. Sure. Just keep practicing, keep practicing. Right? So in the case of the kidney stone uh, operation, one of the things that we're measuring is how many times you're poking the calyx in order to get access. We're measuring the time it takes you, so the time it takes you to do the surgery, how much tissue damage you're doing, what's your tool path. Like, we have a lot of metrics that we're able to judge um, and see improvement. So, obviously, the less time it takes you to do a surgery and the more accurate you are, that's an improvement. Um, but that's very important to us to have a system where, over time, you become better as a surgeon. Um, but there's also kind of a standardized um, system of determining good versus bad surgery, and we're trying to go against that global standard so that that's, that's uh, you know, something that we're, we're measuring. But we're seeing, you know, differences. One surgeon might um, grade a surgeon, a resident on posture. They want the elbows up the whole time. That's not important to another surgeon. So there are key differences 
in your supervisor of, of that, that, that we're able to capture, but, um, you know. So, and then the other thing is the fluoro time. So when you have the x-ray, you put your foot on a pedal and there's a lot of fluoroscopy time and that's just radiating the patient. So we're trying to learn the less fluoro time that you use and you're still able to be accurate, the better you are as a surgeon because it's less radiation for the patient. So there's a bunch of data that we're able to capture, none of which is available on pigs. Like the pigs gives you none of that, none of that data at all, so. Okay, one last question, and then that's I've got it. <laughs> Thank you everybody for sticking around. Yeah. Hi, I just wondered, um, it was on a hardware enthusiast site, I saw a product, maybe a Kickstarter, or it's already there, it's a full mask, you talked about it at the end, it simulates odor, can create wind and add heat, is there research sure. into whether or not, like for the plank, you know, you might feel wind, for the surgeon it might heat up to simulate stress, is there research into whether that's needed or just a gimmick, I mean is that where we're going beyond sight, sound and touch? Uh, so far... I haven't seen anything that looks good. It, 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 there's nothing promising. S smell of vision is definitely not on the in the cards for people. There's not a lot of uh, demand for this. Um, but one of the things that you mentioned, uh, I would point you towards some ideas about ambient data, uh, which is ways that you can express real-time data to people in ways that they might not like have their attention on, and, and uh, so you, know, you mentioned things like you know, heat or cold on your skin is something that could be a data stream that actually does improve you know, surgery or something else or gamers or whatever, but it's, it's because you have mapped it sort of subconsciously to that, uh, and, and you see it, you know, we think about our computer screens and how cluttered they are with data that's constantly coming at us. There's some interesting research on ways to express data in other ways. And, and just on the perception, um, so we can get only a, a certain amount of fidelity with the haptics of our robot, but with things like bone, there's ways, um, of, we've talked to some audio uh, specialists, that if you give the sound of, of your, your tool hitting bone, that you think that it's, it's the haptics that's happening, but it's really just perceptually that you, you know, that sound cute was a cue and then on the smell of vision um, there's some in interesting research on PTSD um, immersion therapy. And uh, in Iraq, you know, folks that, um, you know, they're, they're trying, they've, they've had PTSD, they can't drive because it's, they've had this traumatic event. But the smell of burnt tires is something that triggers much more so than other types of senses. So I think Skip Rizzo's using smell as one of his uh, you know, ways of, of immersing the patient in that experience. So I think there is some research on smell, but, it, but, it's, but I think that's on an industrial kind of scale, not really the, the old scratch and sniff uh, technology.